Okay, welcome everyone back to the second lecture of um, quantum information science, uh, physics 116. Um, today we'll be talking about the kinematics probability. So this kinematics of probability will be the way that we're gonna to try to get a more full understanding of quantum mechanics itself in a very functional way. So we're gonna try and go through uh, the root of the kinematics of probability in order to the kinematics of quantum mechanics. And we'll do everything inside of direct notation to be suggestive of how you should be thinking about things. But be forewarned, this will not be like other presentations of quantum information science. That said, hopefully this will make more sense and help elucidate a lot of the ideas and bring together a lot of the separate things that you may have seen. Um, if you're watching this video now, uh, the lecture notes have already been posted on, on the webpage, uh, which is available at dartgo slash p116 spring 2022 QIS. So feel free to check out the rest of the course, have a look, and um, We'll, we'll talk a bit about that. So the first thing I wanted to discuss today is just uh, that the exercises have been posted for unit one. Um, the entire unit is going to be three weeks long. Uh, we started yesterday on Monday, uh, and this is Wednesday. So uh, in principle, these should have been prepared on Monday. But nonetheless, these are the exercises that you should do over the next two weeks. Um, this is due on April 15th at the end of unit one. And what we've done to try and set this up in a way that you can learn and explore and choose your own adventure in many ways is that you need to pick problems from each category. You don't need to do all the problems, but rather you'll do one problem from each category and there are five categories. Um, so there are four categories. Excuse me. So you have to do four problems. You need to type them up. There's enough students in the class that if everyone works together and there's no collisions on the problems, then the entire problem set should be completed and it'll be a nice representative of the, uh, the strength of the students in the class. Um, in any case, these problems are selected to kind of highlight different ideas that are across several different books. In particular, we're going to look at some of the problems from Nielsen and Chuang. Um, Nielsen Chuang is a fantastic book. It's 20 years old. There's a reason that it's been around for so long, and much the same way that all the ideas from Newton's Principia are still valid because they were good ideas and it was well written. Um, well, I'm not sure that was well written. I didn't read it. Um, but in any case, it had a huge impact. Um, and having a huge impact a lot of times means that the book is, in some sense, timeless, even if we need to do some updates. So the way that I, I've tried to um, realign the textbook with our course is to select problems from throughout the book. We selected problems that emphasize quantum. So I selected problems that emphasize quantum, selected problems that emphasize information and notions of distances. How do we tell things apart quantum mechanically and inside the context of probability? Um, we also look at quantum kinematics. So in this class, the way that we're going to approach the ideas that we're gonna go through is that we're gonna talk about probability first, and then we'll take all the same exact machinery and ideas of probability and apply them to quantum mechanics. And so we say quantum kinematics is when we're thinking about the same ideas of quantum channels as Markov chains, as Markov processes, as quantum Markov processes, all into the same language and the same framework. That means that we're gonna be able to look at different parts of the book in different ways. So you note these problems are from all over the book, chapter eight, chapter nine, chapter 11, chapter eight, uh, chapter two, and chapter one from Nielsen and Chuang. Additionally, there's a set of problems from Gristam and Snell's book on introduction to probability. Um, fun story, a couple fun stories about this book. Um, I found the book when I was in grad school just because I wanted to learn probability. I had completed my math major and I didn't take a class in probability. And I recognized pretty early on that that was a, a pretty big, um, gap. So I just picked up the book and started reading from the beginning. I ended up corresponding with the authors in order to get um, in order to get a copy of all the even solutions. Uh, and a funny story is the TA, uh, AJ, he has a personal connection to Grinstead. His son was actually best man at his wedding, or one of the one of the groomsmen at the wedding. Um, in any case, uh, hopefully it's not too uh, personal story to share. But nonetheless, uh, 
the book is, is really nice for self-study. And so I've selected a few problems from the book that are around Bernoulli trials that will uh, synchronize well with what you're going to be doing in uh, next week's lab and in the following week's lab. And this is also a few exercises around just some basic ideas inside of permutations, instead of um, convergence that will be useful for attacking the lab. So uh, yeah, check out the book uh, and enjoy. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's the problem set. Um, you should type your problem sets with the intention of someone else reading it. It should not be problem sets for you to write down, you know, how you solve the problem, but rather a problem set for you to write down and explain how you solve the problem. Uh, most of these problems, at least from Nielsen and Chuang, as well as from Grissom and Sal, are really meant for self-study. So you're writing this to help someone else self-study. If they get stuck on the problem, your problem should help them find their way through the solution. So be pedantic and be professional. Um, and if you want any feedback on the problem sets, of course, send them to me, send us to it, send them to us early, we can help. And I would again urge you guys to coordinate with your colleagues. If you coordinate with your colleagues, you can really accomplish big things. So uh, remember that this is also training for professional settings and a lot of professional settings, you're gonna be working with other people. And so this is uh, useful to at least coordinate with them even if you don't work with them directly. Uh, plagiarism, all these things are, um, are important that you write down the names of the authors and the contributors to each problem set. If we're gonna uh, present the problem set as a class, it's very useful for everyone to have their name and title and rank or whatever they wanna include appropriately spelled out at the beginning of every document they give to me. So please be sure to include your title. In. Okay, that's it for logistic announcements. Um, Going back to the lecture at hand. Uh, so we're talking about kinematics of probability. Um, so one thing that we're not gonna do, so first let me, let me give an overview perhaps of what the main idea is. The main idea of how we're gonna approach this section, how we're gonna approach this unit, is that we're gonna start off with this notion of things being kinematically defined. That means that we're gonna define what properties this object needs to hold, and we'll think about what transformations preserve that property. So somewhere between mathematical and somewhere between physical and somewhere between strictly uh, probability and somewhere between using quantum theory to describe probability. So a lot of ways you can think about this, but the way that you should not think about this uh, is replacing the L1 with the L2 norm. That is not the way we would think about it. The way that we want to think about things is uh, probability, then we'll do quantum. We'll do quantum here just to kind of set up this, the, the where we're gonna go. So for probability to make sense of what's going on, we need three different um, properties to be satisfied. So we need normalization. And I'm gonna do something that might look a little strange right now, but we're gonna normalize it using a matrix norm. We're gonna use a matrix norm rather than just using an arbitrary norm because we will go um, a bit deeper into what matrix norms are, vector norms, and thinking about different norms and what the different concepts of norms are. But for now, we're gonna use a norm to describe the, uh, the LP norms, which I'll define in a moment. And this should be normalized to one. And the LP norms, uh, put here, red, so LP norms, uh, This xi, we'll take this to the one over pth power. Okay. So this is the LP norm, the L1 norm, p is equal to one, uh, and there's no problem there, just the sum of the absolute values. The L2 norm, we will not actually need very much at all. I think this lecture or the, the series of lectures that we have planned might be a little confusing because the thing that we're not gonna do and this is perhaps how many other introductions of quantum mechanics go, is you take L1 norm and you replace it with the L2 norm. So you have it's a probability vector and you have some normalized wave function. Let me take a second and disabuse you entirely of that picture. Um, this picture, there's nothing wrong with it, but we will not be using it. We just won't need to. So, and in many ways, you might come to disagree and think that that perhaps not the best way to explain 
how quantum and classical are connected. So uh, I'll leave it to the reader or to the listener to think through um, how they think about quantum mechanics. But we're going to do it this way so that we can get a handle on a lot of um, technical things that will be useful for us to understand quantum information science. So if we choose a normalization for an arbitrary vector, then we also have to require that the elements of this particular vector are real. So in the previous uh, setting, we actually can define a few more things. Let me be pedantic. Excuse me. So if we have complex numbers, which we will use immediately, so that way there's no mystery here. Um, the absolute value of z uh, equal to the absolute value of a plus bi is equal to a squared plus b squared. Okay, so that's just how we think of the norm for a complex number. And so when we talk of pi here, this is the norm for a complex number. We will not uh, water down anything. We will use complex numbers from the very beginning. And it's a little strange to use complex numbers in the discussion of probability, but we want to do so such that the parts that are central to being quantum mechanical are separated from the parts that are just notation. Okay. And the third property that we need is positive semi-definite. Positive definite. This is saying that PI is greater than or equal to zero. This is a conceptual preview for how this course is going to unfold. Um, it's useful to immediately write down what the conditions are for a quantum state. And if we write down the conditions for the quantum state, they're completely analogous. And this is how we want to think through um, what's going on in many settings of uh, the discussion of quantum mechanics. So say real valued. And here we'll be a little more precise in real valued spectrum because we're going to think about matrices. So we have a matrix now, and this matrix is going to be normalized to be a little careful here to point out that this one norm is over the eigenvalues of this matrix. This is actually called the trace norm. And we'll define these things a little, a little more precisely um, later on. We're gonna assume that this is normalized. Okay. We have a real value spectrum. We also need to be positive definite or semi-definite. Okay. What does that mean for matrices? For matrix uh, that's uh, square, lambda of rho is real. And this is implied by the Hermitian property if rho is equal to rho dagger. This is the adjoint of rho, um, which I uh, assume that you've heard of, uh, which you know, may, may not be true, but hopefully. Certainly feel free to ask questions or email if, as is necessary. Okay, and just uh, those of you who haven't seen it before, um, it's useful to, to know the shorthand for, for all. Um, you just write down an upside down A. This is equivalent to saying for all. Okay, you know, hopefully save you a few minutes if you come across it. So this is the key idea of how we're gonna think about aligning our thoughts on quantum mechanics, our thoughts of quantum information with thinking about our thoughts on probability theory and probability information. So thinking about information that's contained inside of a probability vector is the same idea of thinking of the information contained inside of a quantum density matrix. And so we're actually going to align these things a bit more. But let me um, take a second to uh, say something about notation. Um, this is something that I think is actually relatively interesting to, to take a moment to appreciate. And then I'll give a few examples of what do I mean by probability vector. If for nothing else, just to establish notation. So uh, the first thing I want to point out is that this is called, or what I called it rather, inside these lecture series, probability density vectors. And uh, 
as far as I know, this is not exactly standard terminology, but we're going to stretch our uh, notational imagination to try and see if we can make sense of this. So often you hear probability density. And coming from a pretty reasonable argument from quantum mechanics, you can actually think about how this normalizes. Take the norm over some space of three space. We have three R. We'll put in P of X. And we can think about the dimension analysis, the dimensional analysis for this. And on the right side, we have units of probability. And then that's going to be equal to units of volume times the units of P of X. So hopefully everyone's uh, good with their dimensional analysis. So easy enough to see this is probability per volume. Okay, so this is a, a pretty nice way to kind of get a, a sense of what the units are. And so this makes sense that it's probability per volume. That's how we define a density. Okay. Now, this doesn't hold in the case that we have a discrete density matrix unless we just use our imagination a little bit. So that's exactly what we're going to stretch a little bit to try and achieve. So let's say probability density vector. It's a stretch to call a density vector, but we're going to stretch because it's going to make the uh, terminologies align much better to the quantum case with how we should be thinking about it in the ordinary case. So we have some discrete sum. The discrete sum will be over all, all spatial regions. So the delta k, and we'll have pk, just to preserve the format that we had before. So then this plays the role of a volume element. This plays... Uh, this plays the role of our volume element. This plays the role of our integration. And here's the role being played by Px. And so we're going to just rearrange this. We have to stretch our imaginations a little bit. And so we still have on the right side probability. And then here we have volume in a generalized sense. Okay. <laughs> and if we do so, we get probability per volume. This volume in quotes because this is in a line and um, yeah, it being in a line says a lot about uh, whether or not it's a volume or whether it's just a line element. But if we use the terminology that it's a quote unquote volume, um, then we can just still call this a probability density. Um, it's not great notation or great, it's not great uh, derivation for that. And in fact, there's probably more sensible things to think of it as, but. We'll do it this way because what's going to work out really well is that this will allow us to call these probability density matrices. And then what we're going to have on the other hand, um, in the quantum case, when we go to quantum, we'll have um, quantum probability density matrices. The terminology for probability density matrix is quite standard. So we're going to stick with the standard terminology inside of quantum information science. And yeah, exactly. So we'll line this idea of probability density vectors with probability density matrix. Um, so let me give some examples of probability density matrices. Um, I just, okay. I have more space. Okay. Now, uh, for some examples, let's give an example. Um, I think P zero, and let's just give example of a vector 
and this will be P1, P2, and P3. Um, this is the, so this is Dirac notation, and we're gonna extend it a little bit further to be even more precise, what we mean by this. So I have E1 hat for some basis vector times P0, two acting on p0 e3 zero. this could for instance be uh so sorry let's just drop the zeros for the, for the moment we'll just leave the p in there and then we'll give um p0 this would be an actual vector rather than an arbitrary one so p0 for us we'll just take for the sake of consistency with the notes zero point so five percent of whatever the, the first Entry is 15% in the second entry or 15.15. Uh, and this is a vector that satisfies all three of the conditions that we set out. Um, and this will be our, our toy example. Okay. So the example at hand, what we can now see is that this is just expanding the basis. Um, we have 0 0.05 times E1 hat plus 0.15 to hat plus 0.83 hat. Okay. We have this example. I went through this uh, slightly slowly because it's just to illustrate notation. Um, we do need to speak about a few other things about this probability vector, because right now we've been very abstract about everything. So to give a little bit of, um, of hope for those of you who wanted some actual, you know, statements made rather than just mathematical uh, generalities, let's take a second and write down what do we mean by a probability vector, by a probability. So um, interpretation. We're going to interpret this in the following way. We're going to say that PI is the probability of the ith outcome occurring upon measurement. Okay, this will be the time to ask a lot of questions about what does this mean? Is it a real thing? Is it a reflection of our knowledge? Is it how we understand things? Is it one way or the other? And you can ask a lot of these questions. They're all very good questions. And I think um, two of the main places you want to learn more or your interest in all these different concepts inside of philosophy that show up very early on when talking about probability functions, you can ask, is a probability function a real thing? And this is whether or not it's ontic. And that's just related to whether it is a thing. So it's actually a thing. Like, related to existence. And epistemic constructions are related to knowledge. So in some sense, in the discussion of quantum mechanics, quite often people invoke the argument that probability is essential. Probability being essential to the situation would mean that there's some ontic aspect to it. It's not about things that we don't know, but it's rather essential to the situation. You could also imagine um, and I really like this um, in some physics textbooks, when they talk about the vector for velocity or the vector for acceleration, you can think of that vector as actually being the thing that you're describing and not a mathematical tool, but actually the velocity as an actual object with direction. And it's actually something that really exists for an object. And so that's the question of whether it really exists or not. In, in practice, these, these problems don't normally um, Get to you. You think about uh, an experiment you do, or you think about uh, someone saying colloquially, "I'll probably be there. I'll probably be back by nine. You know, how likely do you do? Do you really believe that person? You know, are they sure they'll be back at nine? Is it really in their control? Is it preset? Or they might something happens? You know, there's a lot of things about it that that even what they know might not be the situation at hand. In any case, uh, these are some of the ideas that are played with inside of the foundations of probability. We're pointing them out here because these also show up in the foundations of quantum mechanics. By pointing them out here, hopefully it makes it clear these ideas 
are not new to quantum mechanics. There's not quantum mechanical ideas um, per se. There's some extensions that, that matter, but um, let me make one more note before we move past here. And that these basis vectors here, um, these are basis vectors that are corresponding to outcomes. We could be more precise about what is the jth outcome. Does the jth outcome mean that the jth player lost, or is the jth outcome that the jth player won? Right. And so these are these are these are points where you can have two different meanings to the same thing. And we'll 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 deal with that in a few minutes. I think the, the next thing I want to really highlight, and this is something I think is super important, because I've heard this said and different professional levels and different educational levels of people saying things about the size of the Hilbert space being where quantum computers get their power. I would like to, at this point, make sure, underline that that is not true. That is not the situation. And I will lay it out as clearly as possible. But first we can think of you have n bits and I have n qubits. We're gonna take a, general subjects, you've heard of what a qubit is. Qubit being a two-level system. So if you haven't heard of a qubit, no problem. But let me just say that it's the quantum generalization of a bit. And if we have in qubits, how, many, how much space do we have? Right, so I, I assume that you thought about it, you have an answer in your head. If we have in bits, how much space do we have? How many numbers does it take to describe in bits? Um, when I, when I first posed this question, uh, someone guessed the number n, which is fine guess. It's a reasonable guess, but that is um, exponentially smaller than the correct answer. It's not n numbers to specify the state for n bits, but rather two to the n numbers. Well, two to the n minus one numbers. In bits. Why? Because we have, for example, for um, three bits, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, P1, P2, dot, 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 P8. If we go to the quantum situation, we still have space of 2n, um, we won't do it without mathematical setup for it, but we can just state quite easily, whatever you've seen, if you know what a qubit is already, you know that the basis states are still the, these states labeled and tensor product together, everything nice and easy, but there are two to the n states. There are also two to the end states. In the quantum case, you could take superpositions, linear combinations, all that nice stuff. But nonetheless, there's still two to the end states. So the size of the state space is not exponentially larger. Um, you could argue that it's maybe um, some, because one's a matrix and one's a vector, but they're living in the same dimensional space. One's two to the end vector and the other one will be two to the n by two to the n matrix. But nonetheless, the size of space is not what's gaining the quantum computer power. So be cognizant of this, do not make that argument and be wary of hearing that argument because um, it shows up every once in a while. Okay, what's next? Um, let's go into a little more detail about measurement. I think this is a, a very interesting issue that shows up inside of quantum mechanics, but it shows up by way of probability theory. And the problem is with probability theory and perhaps quantum mechanics, the opposite problem. In probability theory, many times people assume that they know what's going on. In quantum theory, quite often people assume it's very difficult and they throw their hands up and don't worry about it. Uh, but in probability theory, people assume that they have the right answer. And it's actually rather difficult to, to go through probability theory and pull out all the right answers or statistics and pull out the right answers without some formal training in that subject. And this, I think, is the origin of a lot of the uh, Bohr-Einstein debates is just, um, you know, 
trickiness with probability theory. Not that um, there was any problem doing so analytically or correctly, but the reasoning around probability theory requires one to start with a few more ideas than classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, there's no probability theory at all. In quantum mechanics, probability theory shows up immediately, but if you generalize from statistical mechanics to quantum mechanics, then you also get this route through probability first. And in fact, um, the initial realizations that you need to use quantum theory were all coming from statistical mechanics. So that's to say that probability is a foundational aspect of quantum mechanics, and so it makes sense to start there first. A lot of the issues that you have instead of quantum mechanics, like the wave function collapse, you know, this is something that um, I was uh, I discussed with Cesar Rodriguez Rosario many, many, many years ago when I was a graduate student, and he gave the following argument that was, you know, very persuasive about the idea of collapse. So I have some probability distribution for whether it's going to rain or not tomorrow. Okay. And then I look out the window when I wake up in the morning and it's raining, then well, I just update my probability distribution. Easy as that. Then my new probability distribution is now one, zero. My probability function has collapsed. Instantaneously, if you didn't take into account the update, uh, you can make very nice and sophisticated, sensible arguments about how to do this correctly. This would be Bayesian updating, a lot of different ideas around that, where you're gonna learn about something and you'll just keep updating your information and you uh, gradually change your probability distribution or change it immediately as in this case. The same thing's true of a quantum state. And so one thing I'm gonna urge you to think about as you go through the next set of the next few lectures is to think that the probability function is not a random thing. It's weird to say the probability function is not a random thing, but the probability function is well-defined until you measure it. The probability function is well-defined until you measure it. So it's telling you about what will happen when you do the measurement, but the function itself, if we take an ontic point of view of it, it's a function itself before you do any measurements. So it's actually more useful to work with it as a probability function than to worry about the measurement outcomes. The measurement outcomes come because you, you, need, to, you need to get some information out of this. I think uh, in class there was a question about um, how this situation where you're doing some Bayesian learning update differs from other situations where you can't do just the Bayesian update because you learn new information. Um, if you want to take a frequentist interpretation of how things go, you can also do something similar where you'll do in your lab, which is, for instance, learning the bias of a coin. From a weighted coin. So this also requires you updating your um, your probability distribution after many, many measurements. Um, and this is um, what we'll be doing next week for the lab, which is the newly trials. Uh, yeah. There's a few exercises in the uh, homeworks to look at Bernoulli trials. So have, have, a feel, have a good time to look at that. I think Bernoulli trials gives a very good example of how measurement shows up in ordinary probability and how you can use those measurements to infer something about the situation at hand, right? So these are all two level examples. So of course you can do multi-level examples, but I think this is enough to illustrate the major points I wanted to get across. Okay, um, yeah, so let me, let me take a second, I'll put a page here. Okay, so what's next? What we're about to get into now is thinking about how probability functions can change. So we've talked about the, the measure. So, so far we've talked about um, conditions. One, the probability function. And two, we've talked about interpretation. We won't talk about interpretation any further. Or you know, we'll talk about it as it shows up, but we won't need to talk about it any further for the rest of this discussion. What we're going to do now, and for the remainder of this section, 
the next to the remainder of today and then, uh, part of Friday is to look at what the consequences are. Parentheses. What are the consequences of maintaining those conditions? Maybe not motions for transformations. Use that. So what we're going to do is answer this question in several different ways. And we're going to do so by thinking about certain classes of transformations. Right? So we're going to take first transformation that doesn't do much. We'll take um, change of basis transformations. Think about stochastic change of basis transforms. Think about stochastic transformations in general. We'll get to that on Friday. Um, and then we will end our discussion of the consequences of those conditions with the uh, differential equation describing the changes in uh, differential changes in probability. So that's our game plan for how we're going to understand probability. Let me say here uh, that the change of basis that we're going to look at for probability theory would be different than the change of basis we look at for quantum mechanics. But nonetheless, this idea, this idea, and the rest of these ideas will all be exactly how we're going to approach quantum theory as well. And we'll see that this, you know, requires complex numbers as some background information that you can't live without it because we have eigenvalues. Permission, permission things that need to be around so the eigen spectrum remains real. So all these things show up, but nonetheless, the, the major point is, is that the structure of the equations, the structure of how we get the equations will still follow the same um, outline. So first we are gonna to turn to change of basis formulas for a change of basis transforms for probability functions. Um, a central point inside of this uh, intellectual development of quantum mechanics and of quantum information theory is that we're gonna think of the change of basis for a probability function as a permutation. Or out here. See the permutations of, this is S3. In S3, this is a representation for the permutation group, which is you know the set of what well, maybe don't know, but it's the identity, the permutation you swap one and two. The permutation where you swap two and three, permutation where you swap one and three, uh, two, the permutation where you swap one, two, three, and the permutation where you swap one, three, two. I will introduce the cycle notation a bit later. So bear with me if you haven't seen the notation. Okay, so these permutations that I've drawn, these are the six permutations that make up the symmetric group. Uh, of S3. In general, this is actually, it's a very beautiful group mathematically, but practically this is not a very fun group. Um, so the number of elements is in factorial. In factorial elements permutations. And if you haven't thought about it, factorial is extremely poorly growing number um, that it grows very, very rapidly. Uh, so you very quickly run out of the ability to go through the entire permutation group for any algorithmic purpose. So um, getting around that's actually super important. One of the ways you can get around it is by labeling things carefully, by thinking about how to use symmetries, all these things are very nice. And just to give one first glance at it, if you haven't seen it before, is that these permutations are broken up by the cycle structure. And this is how many things are being interchanged by each cycle inside the, inside of the permutation. Here, two things are being exchanged. And then there's a cycle with nothing being exchanged for all three of these permutations. For this permutation, everybody's moving between everyone. 
these are the permutations where you take um, one goes to three goes to two. So in this notation, standard for things to go in this order. Uh, to be swapped this way. And I'll give an example in a second. So let me actually just, just focus on, on what we said so far. Okay. Uh, I would pause here to ask for questions, but I'm recording this alone. So I will assume that you take a second, breathe, look at this, think about meditation, think about what's going on. Um, this is a picture of the, of the, the cup game, Monty. And in this picture, we're going to think about swapping these around. So he's going to put this down. You won't be able to see the ball anymore. And then it'll swap this one with this one and this one. It'll be some permutation from this set. You have to guess which one it is. Okay. So um, in thinking about doing the permutation from that set, you could play this game in a very passive way that you could imagine that it's a game where you show up in, in this version of the game. The hustler doesn't move his hands at all, but he doesn't speak English or you know, just speak whatever language you speak and you can't communicate with them and you can't point because I don't know whatever game reason you make up, but you can't point. And so then the question can be establishing language to say which cup you think the ball's under. And if you establish the language correctly, maybe you get to the, uh, the gray language, get a one, a two, a three, or you have uh, maybe the purple language. Oh, it doesn't show up. The lime green language, two, three, and one. And so by just changing how we talk about things, we can actually reorder uh, the labels, which is not a very interesting way to relabel them. But nonetheless, it's still a permutation. That's what we call a passive permutation. Because we haven't done anything. Um, one thing that you can think about is in the case of mechanics, uh, we have some vector, it's pointed off in some direction. And you can imagine updating the system to rotate the vector, but you've done so strictly by rotating the axis. So now the angles have changed between the blue and the uh, between the blue and the green axes, but the blue vector has not changed at all. So this is a passive rotation because now we write down the reputation for this blue vector and the green numbers. It'll have a different representation now. So if this were uh, I don't know one comma one. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Okay, never mind. I'm not going to do it live. It's, it's a little tricky to do the, the transformation correctly in my head. Um, use cosine and sines, but yeah, I, I can't do it live. But the idea being that you transformed by rotating these axes here. This is in contrast to doing something active. So an active transformation would be that there's a hustler here. And so instead of active, let's say we want to do active transformation. You actually move this cup here, this cup here, and then you've accomplished moving box three to two, to one, the sense of the blue basis, or the blue language, whatever you want to call it. Right, so I actually had a lot of fun thinking about this this morning, a lot of fun. I was thinking a lot about how these labels change versus how the cups change. And so it's, it's very different. You have to think about what statement you're making and then what you're referring to in that statement. So there's a lot of semantics that come into play. It's interesting, the semantics come into play the other way you can think that this could come into play is just how you organize things. So if I have a set of three cups, you know, who's to say which order it should be ordered? Should I, should I number from the left to right? If I'm over here, then I might go one, two, three, because I'm looking at it, I see the one closest to me. 
is uh, one, two, three. But then, you know, somebody else looking at this sitting over here, they might see it as uh, one, two, three. And so this is a relabeling that's not relabeling at all, but rather miscommunication, however you might want to think of it. And so one important way that these things can also be miscommunicated, and I think this is worth writing down and, and, uh, and highlighting here, is that if we have a probability vector, P, to write down as P1, P2, P3, in many textbooks, what you see is a probability vector written the following way. These probability vectors can lead to a consistent formulation of probability. In both the cases, they satisfy all three of the axioms that we gave. Um, so in principle, there's no difference from the, from the kinematic point of view of how these will need to transform. You need to keep the form that they're in valid as you make the transformations, but you can formulate probability theory either way. And if you reorganize this, you can also formulate it in one way that I had somebody formulated this, you know, instead of row and column vectors, maybe they did some weird transposes of doing the column vectors. So instead we have, let's, say, let's put another color. So this is reordering from one probability distribution to the other. And so this concept gives rise to a few different notions that we'll see when we come back to quantum mechanics. And, and, and it's worth thinking about a little bit here. Um, this organizational problems or organizational aspects of how we write down things and probability theory is important to write down here because even in such a problem sets, Grissom and Snell prefers these type of probability vectors, whereas we will always use probability vectors as column vectors. So be wary of what source you're reading, how they've organized things. It can change how you need to interpret everything. And that's not interpretation in the sense of what do these numbers mean to me outside of this mathematical context, but interpretation of what do these numbers mean within this mathematical context? Which one's first, which one's second, which number am I using for the first component, which number should be in the second component, so on and so forth. Okay, we're coming towards the end of the lecture. Um, let me... Uh, not speed up, but let me just highlight a few examples. So we had this example um, probability vector that we had earlier of 5%, 15%, 80%. And we've just expanded a little bit to illustrate how these basis vectors look. Uh, basis vectors are just as you'd expect from your introductory linear algebra course, where you've learned it from. Um, and then we, we act with this permutation matrix. Here's an illustration of how the cycle notation works. Remember I said one goes to three, so you see one goes to three, two goes to one, and three goes to two. You have to be a little careful about reading diagrams of this sort. So diagrams of this sort, if you see them inside of a book, you need to look around and find out whether they're reading from left to right or right to left. Um, it's not always an issue, but in the case that we talk about quantum circuit diagrams, quantum circuit diagrams do not read in the order that you read a book. And do not read in the order that you multiply matrices. So multiplying the matrices and reading the circuit are in opposite directions. So it really matters whether you read from left to right or right to left. If we go left to right, then we have P one, two, three, maybe, or I have P three, two, one. Right now it is going from one to three. So the, let's go this way. Right. So this is the idea of the permutation. There's a matrix that will represent that, that permutation as we um, maybe highlighted. If not, I'll give an example. Yeah, I didn't give an example. So let me give a quick example here um, for how to write down this matrix. This one's not fun, but not too bad. So P, one, two, one, 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 zero, zero. Three. With this is actually enough to generate the group. These are called generators because if I continue to multiply out, I'll get out the full group. So this is the idea of permutations, the representations 
Um, it's worth noting that these representations that I've written down for these permutations are unitary representations. And if I take the transpose and multiply them together, I get back the identity. So it's an interesting property that will be very useful for us to think about how to generalize this when we get to the sequel and talk of quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, in class, there was also a question about if I just do a permutation and I just have these numbers, P1, P2, P3, in the case that we've been playing around so far, 0 0.05, 0 0.15, or sorry, yeah, good, and 0.8. We just relabel this. We really haven't changed anything. The information that we had about what's going on is still pretty easy to track as long as you know how you changed it. You know, there's no real difference to us. You need know, to be a little careful about on the back end or the front end about how you define things semantically. We just talk with different events. We can do it passively. We could do it actively. But in both cases, just to change the basis, nothing really has happened. Now, that's not very interesting. So I think we want to go a little bit beyond that. So with the last few minutes, what I want to introduce is taking a convex combination of probability uh, of, of, of transformation. So if we're playing the Monte Card game, it's not very fun if he can play the game without ever touching it. It's just a language game. Monte is not supposed to be a language game. It's very easy to set up the language for this game, regardless of what you speak. You point to one of the cups, and that's enough for us to you know, communicate what you think is going to be the winner cup. So when they're playing this game adversarially, and they want to win your money, and hopefully not cheating, but even if cheating, they're still playing it adversar adversarially. What they're going to do is affect permutations. So right now there's a there's a, a dark blue permutation, there's a purple permutation, and a brown permutation here. The permutations will happen very rapidly, back to back to back, and you won't be able to tell which one has been executed. And so when the game's done, and he says, "Okay, take your choice," then there's going to be probably distribution over what permutation you think happened. And there's very much the 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 notion of the permutation the the probability distribution representing your lack of knowledge. Because in this case, you really don't know because you did it very quickly. And it may also represent you know, the propensity for, this, for, the, for the operator to be cheated. It also gives a very nice sense of what a permutation is operationally, because there's an actual operator who execute the action of a permutation, which is to swap these cups. Um, in any case, this is how you can think about it. And if you do this, do it this way, then you get out stochastic matrices. What's stochastic matrix? Stochastic matrix. Transformation more generally. Preserves. Well, I guess it preserves the properties of probability functions. If we do it this way, we get out valid transformations of probability functions. Um, you can see an example, just to, just to be clear about how this would work, is that you either apply this, this permutation that we, we looked at with some probability half, or you do nothing with probability half. Let me also highlight here that this uh, probability distribution over the permutations needs to be normalized. So this. If it wasn't clear. Um, so this is actually a way of defining a convex com a com convex combination where um, you have different objects added up, but they add up the the weights on the objects add up to one. We'll see this um, in the sequel. We get to quantum density matrices. So here's an example with the same toy vector. We just rearranged everything. We added it up. Added it up. And what you should see is that this adds up to one, right? 0 0.4, 0 0.4, there's 0.8, there's a one. Yeah, exactly, adds up to one. So this notion of a stochastic transformation as a sum of permutation matrices is not the most general one that you can have. In fact, um, this is so-called uh, bistochastic matrix. Uh, what does bistochastic mean?
means that if I have a probability vector P, then I act with a bistochastic matrix M. Or if I have, let's say I have uh, These, yes, doesn't matter at all. So now if I have a bistochastic matrix M, then this matrix M will transform an arbitrary probability function to another arbitrary probability function, still valid. Okay. Uh, additionally, if it's bi-stochastic, that means that also if we have with the valid probability function here on the left, highlight these are not the same, or at least they don't need to be, they could be the same. This is also still a valid probability density vector. Not all stochastic matrices matrices that work inside the first situation will be valid working on um, working on uh, on row vectors. So this is one way to think about bistochastic. There's other ways to think about bistochastic, but um, you can also think of it as just any stochastic matrix that can be decomposed into a sum of permutation matrices. Um, I believe the characterization is different only if. In any case, uh, you can check out Horn and Johnson for more information about bisochastic matrices um, and just learning more about matrices in general. That's also a fantastic book for self-study. Um, so uh, this is Matrix Analysis by, by Horn and Johnson. And there's many exercises from that book that are um, very nice for, for getting your handle around mathematics. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm about at time, so we'll stop here. Next time we'll pick up is, is resume discussing bistochastic matrices. We'll discuss um, how, how to go beyond bistochastic matrices, and then we'll look at the differential equations governing the evolution of probability functions. And then that'll be a chance for us to uh, just collect the major results that we've kind of gone through, the major notations, and just directly import them into quantum theory and follow the same exact route that we've gone down so far. So that's the plan, uh, and we'll resume on Friday. The notes have been posted, uh, the homework has been posted, uh, so feel free to read along, and we will continue uh, with, we'll resume with bisochastic matrices on uh, Friday.